name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. St. Teresa. If you're wondering why there are so many cars and so few people, they've all gone to a barbecue. There's a school barbecue on, and I think I should have gone to that instead. Uh, <clears throat> it'd be far more fun. Okay, this is our second of, the, of our three Lenten talks, which are dedicated to reflections on St. Teresa of Avila, St. Teresa of Jesus, the woman who founded the order that I belong to, the woman who founded the order that the nuns up at Ganelabar belong to, and you all know them. Um, they're the ones that are locked away. And if you ever get to know them as I know them very well, you'd be able to say to them that knowing you, I can see why we've locked you up. <clears throat> okay, let's turn to what we were. Last week we looked at St. Teresa and we looked at her life, I think, and fundamentally focus on the characteristics of her personality. That was done for an obvious and simple reason, and that is that God is seen through people, not kind of in the perfection of a human being. I don't know what a perfect human being looks like, but God is, is vis made visible in a human being in terms of their personality, their difficulties, their virtues, their holiness, their sinfulness, their temptations. All of these things are part of what it is to be human. And if a person is given to God and works with God, then all of those things are the things that God works through. So last week we looked at the person of St. Teresa, her personality. <clears throat> Kind of what, what would it have been like to have known her and been with her? Because that's the saint. A, a saint that doesn't have human characteristics. A saint that doesn't annoy some people. A saint that isn't at times difficult to live with is not a saint. Because when we look at the gospel, this was also Jesus. He was a difficult son. He annoyed people. He had his own quirks and likes and dislikes and weaknesses, which I think we, we inverted to last week. This was a Teresa I wanted you to meet because of all the saints that we have in the Catholic Church, she is one of the most human of the saints and therefore is one of the most approachable one of the easiest to relate to, because everything that I am, she is in a way also. Now I want to turn to something that I, I passed over, but said the great thing that Teresa did in the year 1562, which was to begin the reform of the Carmelite order on the 24th of August, the Feast of St. Bartholomew, she founded the great Carmel outside the walls of Avila called the Carmel of St. Joseph, San Jose. Um, our order is the order that brings devotion to St. Joseph into the church, largely through St. Teresa. She founded this as a place where a group of women could live a life totally dedicated to God, to Jesus Christ and to him alone a community which was grounded in friendship with Jesus Christ. And that friendship was the, was the central thing which all the spokes connected to, as if the community is a wheel, connected through their relationship to Christ and through that forming a community. And so she says, anyone who is a discalced Carmelite must be a friend. Our communities are communities of friends. We're all loved, all are equal. Now that's very nice in theory. 
the practicality of it as soon became evident to St. Teresa was, he had all these women together trying to live a holy life, loving Jesus Christ and loving each other, and it won't be long before they start getting annoyed with each other. In fact, it's funny. You lock up a group of women and they struggle more than locking up a group of men. It's a funny kind of thing. It's got to do with the dynamics. And this troubled St. Ch- Saint Teresa. But it's no different in a family. Husband and wife get married thinking the rest will be bliss. It's not long before they're annoying the hell out of each other. Be wonderful to have children. It's not long before the children are annoying the parents and each other. And everything which in theory would be something so wonderful is falling apart. I as a bishop every now and then meet beautiful families, wonderful husband and wife, wonderful children. When I see that, I think to myself, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have joined the Carmelites. I could have had that. But God in his mercy the next week shows me the family from hell. And then I say to myself, that's what I would have had. I would have had a wife and a family like that. And I go back and I'm happy being a Carmelite again. But you know that the theory is wonderful. It begins with such high ideals, but the reality is difficult. The reality is well nigh impossible without God. And St. Teresa recognizes this, and she begins to write about it to her, to our sisters in chapter four of The Way of Perfection, a very significant thing, but what she says there is equally valid and applicable to marriages and families. I'll turn to it first. It's something which is very dear to us Carmelites. And it's in chapter four. I hope it is anyway, the way of perfection. And she says this, our rule states that we must pray without ceasing. If we do this with all the care possible, the discipline, the silence and the commands will not be wanting. She goes on to say that if we, and she's speaking to the Carmelites, but she speaks to everybody, that all we have to do is strive in the best way possible to do what we promised. I suppose that's true of religious life. It's true of marriage, it's true of of anything. When we commit ourselves to something, we make a promise to each other and to God. And St. Teresa says, if only we could simply do what we promised, to put it another way. And the answer is, it's not so easy, it falls apart. So she goes on to say this, I shall enlarge on three things for you, because she says these three things make possible what we promised. And these are the three. The first is love, the second is detachment, and the third is true humility. Because she says if these are in place, the tasks that we have given ourselves in life will become the very possible. And I want to go through each one of them to illustrate what she means by it. Let's start with the first one, which she says is love. And it's the kind of thing everyone thinks, oh yes, I can do that, I can love. I ask this question of all the kids that I confirm. Children, is it easy to love? Oh yes, Bishop. Hands up those of you who are expert in loving. They open up their hands. And then I say to them, well, tell me the truth. Hands up those of you who fight with your brothers and sisters. And they all put up their hands. And I say to them, you tell me that you can love and you, it's easy to love. The very person you're meant to love is the person you fight with. They put their heads down because they don't know what to say. Because we presume that we can love. I wish that I could. When I look at my life, 
is very, I find it very difficult to identify love. But I can identify very quickly where I failed to love. That in fact is what St. Paul does in chapter 13 of the first letter to the Corinthians. He says what love is to make you feel bad because you know that that's not what your love is. Love is kind, is always patient. Hands up those of you who are always patient. So how can you read that and think this is beautiful? Because St. Paul is, in a sneaky way, challenging your impatience, your gossip, your delight in other person's wrongs and sinfulness. Because he knows that everyone thinks love is easy. So he's telling you what love is so that you will recognize, yes, the truth is, I recognize where I don't love. Have I ever loved in my life? I don't know, I hope so. I hope I have. I really do. More than anything else, I hope I've loved God. That's my greatest desire. But I don't know whether I love God. Luckily, St. Teresa, which is why we're looking at her, this Lent says, all you have to do is desire to love. And that is sufficient. Because she knows very well that love is where we all fail. So she begins when she talks to the nuns who are struggling to live Carmelite life. Or what I do when I prepare young people for marriage is, well, tell me how you love. Are there any failings there? And the answer is, if we're honest, there are failings. And that's the first step in St. Teresa's three things. Love, detachment, or humility, or as we Carmelites properly speak of it, as humility, detachment, and love. I fail in love. I would never stand up and say to someone, I'm good at loving. Because I don't recognize myself loving as God would want me to love. But I do recognize the places in my life where I've failed. And St. Teresa says to her sisters and to each of us, that's the starting point for getting things right. That's the starting point for pleasing God. It's a starting point for a life directed towards holiness. You don't begin by saying, I want to do holy things. You begin with the truth. And that is, the gospel calls me to love and I have failed. Step one. It's a massively good step for each of us. And so the next question which arises is, why have you failed in love? What is it in me that causes me to fail? What are the obstacles? And don't give, give the silly answer, oh, because I'm sinful. That's like going to the doctor and saying, I'm feeling sick, tell us about it, I just feel sick. It's not very helpful. It's at this point that we must start looking at where we fail. Why do I fail? And the answer will be for St. Teresa, as it also is for St. John of the Cross, because rather than being about God, I'm about something else. And to put it in their terminology, I'm not free. I have attachments. I'm attached to certain things. Why do I fail in love? Because I'm attached to my own comfort. Why do I fail in love? Because I'm attached to what people think about me. Why do I fail in love? Because I'm attached to having my own way. Why do I fail in love? And on it goes. Whatever it is, I, I could sit here and keep on naming things. Why do you fail in love? Because there's something else in your life which is more important. And it's not an important thing. It's an attachment to something which is about you. 
And when that's in place, you can't love because your love will not be the love of another person or of God. Your love will be self-love. Okay. That's what happens, you know, when, when, when people work out what they want to do for someone and they get it all in place and they want it to be perfect and something goes wrong. Well, perhaps what you didn't stop to think is, what is it that the person you love really wants and needs? It's not necessarily buying them the most expensive watch or taking them on the greatest holiday. Your children want your time, not your money. Your children want your presence and love, not big holidays. And yet we try to express that by giving something which is convenient for us, whereas the inconvenient thing would be, well, I, I won't do this or do that. I won't strive to have another million dollars. I'll spend my life with my children, with my wife, with my husband. Because we're attached to certain things. So the first thing that a fader in love does is it identifies for me where I don't have freedom. It identifies for me what I am attached to. When I'm attached to something, whatever that thing is takes away my freedom because effectively that becomes a false god. It doesn't matter how good it seems or what it is. And I think most of you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's kind of like, he who has some sin, let him throw the first stone. And they walked away one by one, starting with the older ones. Because the older you are, the more you recognize you're failing. And the older you are, the more you recognize what it is within yourself that you're struggling with. Hurts, wants, control, whatever it is. And that has to be let go of. So we've got to another point, which is in fact more difficult than the first one. The first one was simply a statement that I fail in love. But the second one is, my failure in love has got to do with something about myself, something so close to me that it's me myself. And it's very hard to be rid of the things about myself. It's very hard to be rid of what hurts you. It's very hard to be rid of memories that in fact, enslave you. It's very hard to be rid of desires and things you need to have in place without which you don't think you can, you can be yourself and live. And all of those things, as we said at this point, are what stop you from loving. So the challenge now is what we call detachment is the ability to let go of and be free of these, these things. Now, the detachment is something which, if you came to Varaville to my retreats, weekends, I would give four talks on. But I've already spoken for 20 minutes and I've only got 10 minutes left. That might be the topic of another talk. But detachment is very difficult. And the bottom line of detachment, of, which means getting freedom from my false self, getting freedom from what binds me and stops me from giving myself to others and to God, requires something that is much bigger than me. It requires God. And that's where St. Teresa now moves to the last of the three things she mentions. 
love, detachment and humility, which are the essentials for living whatever kind of Christian life you've committed yourself to. I suppose, why is it difficult? Unless you take up your cross, you cannot be my disciple. Unless the seed falls to the ground and dies. All of these images that the Lord gives us are about this. Humility for St. Teresa is the most important virtue and the one thing necessary for growth in the spiritual life, the one thing necessary to move towards God. Because the virtue of, of humility is experiencing and knowing myself as God knows and loves me. That's very hard because we would like to know ourselves the way we want to be known. We want to be known the kind of way we would like to be. But that's not the way God knows me, nor is it the way God loves me. So having gone through failures in love, recognition of what I'm attached to, the next step in order that I might have detachment is to come and be able to live with the truth of who I am. That's very hard. It's very hard because the truth of who I am, the problem is it's not what I want it to be. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could be what we wanted to be? Well, first thing is, why can't I be what I want to be? Well, it will be impossible unless that's what God wants. You know, so much of our living, in fact, we say is towards God, but God is excluded from it because it's my project. It's what I'm doing. It's a way that I want to love. It's a way that I want to be. All of this brings us to the point that this is who I am and I can't do anything about it. If you could, you'd never have to go to confession again. You'd never have anything to say. There are many of you here who are older than me and you've been at it longer than I have. And looking at you, I know you haven't got it right yet. So what hope is there for the Bishop of Lismore? If you who are older than me, in your struggle and, and your, your, your striving to be holy, can't do it yourself. And the truth is, the first step in humility is the recognition and the acceptance of who I am because I can't do it myself. It's something that the great Saint Therese of Lisieux recognized very early in the piece when she said, it's kind of like a baby trying to walk upstairs. As the baby tries to shrug up, the father who is watching at the top will just let the baby keep struggling. But if the baby stops and cries and says, I can't walk up the stairs, what's the father going to do? come down and pick it up and carry it up the stairs. That's the move that has to happen in us. First of all is the profound and deep recognition of the kind of person I am. And that only happens with the constant struggle against myself. Because if I could change myself, that's not the person that I am. I keep struggling and working there. And God does nothing until I can come to the point and say, Lord, this is who I am. I will never give up struggling, but I cannot do anything about this. It's at that point in humility that my experience of myself becomes my prayer. It's a very important point in the, in, in, in the life of humility. At the point when I can turn to God and say, Lord, this is me. This is the man you've created. I could do nothing about it, but I want to love you. The step which begins to happen at that point is 
you will begin to experience that God loves you as you are. Not God loving you the way you think you should be to be loved by God, but when you begin to experience the love of God given to you and poured into your soul the way you are, that is the first time in your life that you will begin to experience the love of God. Because up till then, any love that you get that you think you've got is love that you've earned, the love that you think God owes you. But when you begin to experience the love of God, <clears throat> undeserved, for no reason, at that point you suddenly know what love is and you can begin to go backwards up to love. In knowing who I am and praying from that place, in the eventual experience of the love of God, undeserved, given to a wretched person who is loved by God, I can then begin to have the freedom to let go that these things which formerly bound me no longer bind me because I have the love of God. And as that begins to unfold, I become free enough to love because my love becomes a response to God's love, a love of God and the beginnings of the love of my neighbour. Not love of myself. I say St. Teresa leaves us today with those three things, humility, detachment and love. I fail in love. Why? Because of my attachments and my selfishness. What can I do about that? Really nothing. All I can do is recognise that this experience begins to show me the truth of who I am. And what can I do with that? Nothing but pray. Turn to God from this place. Look at God. That's why in the Old Testament, the king of Nineveh, after hearing Jonah, sat down in sackcloth and ashes. What, what's sackcloth and ashes? Now this, Nineveh is a lot of place of Chinese tailors because they would be making sackcloth and ashes for every time they decided that something had gone wrong. They'd be rich. The sackcloth and ashes are the experience of my own profound inability to love my own attachments and the reality of who I am. And when I recognize that that's who I am, I can pray in my own sackcloth and ashes and turn to God because I've got nowhere else to go. And then in the midst of that, you'll begin to experience the love of God. Then for the first time in your life, you will know the love of God. And knowing that love, you'll begin to have freedom and be able to love. And the truth of what I've said happens in family life, doesn't it? When a kid goes completely wrong, and the parents just love that child. It happened to a friend of mine. His daughter went off the deep end. He couldn't live at home, so a friend let her live somewhere else. Now she's back at home because she's got over that psychological problem. I said to my friend, if she ever comes home, she will be the child who looks after you in your old age. And I reminded him of that, and he said, yes, I remember what you said, and I agree with you. She probably will be the one, because she's the one that knows very profoundly that when she was a mess, we loved her because there was something else we could do. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen and with the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Any thoughts or questions? Does that make any sense? 
There's just a deadly silence every time I say anything. Okay, I'll see you next week. Thank you. <laughs>